All right, the first section, the basic, sorry, the first section is Kant's explanatory resources. So there should be a handout where you've got the section titles and the citations. Okay. I'm putting the handout. That's available. Okay, great. Okay, so the first section is Kant's explanatory resources for figuring out what practical reason is. Kant's declaration in the critique of practical reason that the freedom established by the moral law forms the keystone of the whole edifice of pure re of reason invites system sorry invites readers to approach his theory of practical reason through his moral theory specifically through his search for the necessary conditions for the possibility of morality this approach is also recommended by the parallel with his cognitive theory which emerges from investigations of the necessary conditions for the possibility of empirical cognition. 30 years ago, Marcus Vilashek argued that the focus of Kant's scholars on faculties required for morality is too narrow. His seminal Praktische Vernunft maintains that Kant drew on his predecessor's concepts and theories to develop a more general account of practical reason one not limited to the necessary conditions for morality. Vilashek's claims about Kant's reliance on his predecessors are amply supported in the text. In the introduction to the critique of pure reason, Kant explains that although, the, although moral principles are a priori, a systematic account of morality requires the use of concepts such as pleasure, pain, desire, and choice that are borrowed from experience. Kant is explicit that he is entitled to draw from existing psychological terminology in the critique of practical reason. In a reply to an objection that he had failed to explicate the faculty of desire in the groundwork, Kant notes that, quote, normally this approach would be improper because one should properly be able to presuppose the exposition given in psychology, end quote. Without admitting any misstep, he concedes that the standard psychological account is unsuitable because it assumes that pleasure is always the determining ground of the faculty of desire. Since morality would then be impossible, Kant offers a more neutral account, again quoting, the faculty of desire is the living being's faculty to be, through its representations, the cause of the actuality of the objects of these representations. With no determining ground specified, the possibility of desire being specified by something other than pleasure remains open. The ubiquity of faculty psychology in Kant's ethics suggests that he is going to explain the possibility of morality in part by producing a theory of human practical reason. The two projects are, however, um, subject to different methodological standards. His method in the first two sections of the groundwork is analytic. That is, he regresses from the ordinary person's judgment about morally good and bad actions to the principle that underlies them. As is evident in the text, Kant also intends to reveal the ordinary moral agent's understanding of the necessary psychological conditions for moral action. It's the latter investigation that leads to Kant's famous doctrine of duty, Quoting again, nothing other than the representation of the moral law in itself, which of course can take place only in a rational being, insofar as it, not the hope for effect, is the determining ground of the will, can therefore constitute the preeminent good that we call moral. Kant's claim is, of course, not that ordinary moral agents presuppose this abstract thesis. Lay people would not think in terms of representations or determining grounds, though maybe they think about a free will. His assumption is that a philosopher can use technical, philosophical, and psychological terminology to characterize ordinary judgments about individual cases in an abstract and illuminating way. In addition to ordinary moral consciousness, Kant's moral psychology is constrained by the principles of empirical psychology laid down in the first critique. The architectonic locates empirical psychology within Kant's system. Empirical psychology goes where the proper empirical natural science must be put, namely on the side of applied philosophy, whose a priori principles are contained in pure philosophy, end quote. Any empirical science must follow the pure principles of reason, 
e.g. the principle of homogeneity, and look for the highest genus that encompasses multiple lower species. A second rational maxim commands sciences to look for diversity and unity, and so to seek lower species to accommodate observed differences. In this way, an empirical psychology becomes a system with as much unity as possible, but sufficient diversity to explain the complexity of mental life. The two desiderata for Kant's theories of morality and practical reason, ordinary moral consciousness and the systematicity of science, are not fated to conflict. Lay judgments about morally worthy actions might be captured in a psychological vocabulary that adheres to a genus species method and explanation of ex method of explanation for the empirical sciences. As we will see, however, there are tensions between the two and missteps with an inherited psychological term, term Willkür, which I'm just going to leave Willkür until we figure out what it means. We will also see that it is not Kant's goal of vindicating free will and morality, but his understanding of how practical reason is cognized that limits the scope of his theory to only moral creatures. Okay, so the second section is about faculty mistakes or infelicities in the early critical works, starting with the critique of pure reason. Kant pivots to the practical use of reason at the end of the first critique and immediately defines practical as that which is possible through freedom, through the exercise of a free willkür. He elucidates willkür through two contrasts. First, we might consider a willkür whose exercise is conditioned only by the empirical. In that case, reason's role would be regulative, uniting different inclinations so they might lead to maximal happiness. By contrast, the practical use of reason would also, sorry, the practical use of pure reason would result in our prior laws that command. These are not merely regulative. Kant's second elucidation of Willkür pits animals against humans. For a power of choice is merely animal if it cannot be determined otherwise through, than through sensible impulses. Skipping a bit, we have a faculty of overcoming through representations of what is beneficial or harmful, even in a more remote way, the impressions made upon our sensible faculty of desire. This passage fails to deliver its promised conclusion that humans are not stimulus bound, that they, they can think of remote consequences, not immediate stimuli, does not show that Willkür can be determined otherwise than through sensory impulses. Although these presentations of Willkür raise more questions than they answer, the two contrasts agree in marking a distinction between Willkür that is swayed, sorry, between a Willkür that is swayed solely by pleasure and one that can be commanded by reason. <clears throat> now we're going to get into some harder stuff. Okay, we're going to go back to the first critique here a second. All right, Kant's resolution of the third antinomy in the first critique also po points forward to his moral psychology. In arguing for the compatibility of determinism and freedom within transcendental idealism, he explains that although humans cognize themselves as appearances and so causes in the world of sense, quoting, the human being cognizes himself also through mere apperception, namely in actions and inner determinations that he cannot class at all with any impression of the senses. And thus he is to himself in regard of certain powers, a merely intelligible object. These powers are understanding and reason. Kant devoted considerable effort to elucidating apperception or self-consciousness in the transcendental deduction. Now, although his views about the transcendental unity, transcendental unity of apperception are complex and contested, we can leave aside considerations raised about object cognition and focus on three claims about mental activity that are, as we'll see, directly relevant to his claims about practical reason. In the B deduction, Kant distinguishes apperception from inner sense. Through inner sense, humans are conscious of themselves as they are affected. Conversely, when it synthesizes representations, when it judges, the human understanding performs an act, quote, 
of which the understanding is conscious as an act, even apart from sensibility. Having consciously combined, e.g. the representations heavy and that of bodies, humans do not need an impression of inner sense to inform them that they've made the judgment bodies are heavy. All right, so now turning to the groundwork, the crosswords metaphor, the crossroads metaphor, not words, crossroads metaphor. The groundwork makes several notable claims about human practical reason. Just before presenting his doctrine that the representation of the moral law must determine the will in morally good action, Kant explains that the human will, here villa, not vilcur, quote, stands halfway between its a priori principle, which is formal, and its a posteriori incentive, which is material, as it were, at a crossroads. And since it must, after all, be determined by something, that's the crucial part here, in a sense, the after all, doch, suggests that it was widely accepted that the will must be determined by something. In the new elucidation, Kant had argued against the opposing view of Crucius that a free will means no determination. As he presents the view, that is, as Kant presents the view, Crucius thinks that it is foolish to ask why someone performed a free action. Quoting Kant here, if you ask, why did someone not do someone else? He, Crucius, will reply, because he's already doing that. He therefore thinks that a free will is actually determined by its existence, not antecedently, antecedently by grounds that are prior to its existence, end quote. Kant takes the mere statement of the view, a free will is determined by its existence to suffice for its refutation. So what the groundwork is telling us with the crossroads, meta crossroads metaphor is that the will has got to be either determined that must be determined by something, and it's got to be either something material or formal. Okay, moving on with the groundwork. The groundwork also identifies villa and practical reason. So he, Kant characterizes the rational will, villa, as follows. We all know this, quoting, a rational being has the capacity to act according to the representation of laws, i.e. according to principles, or a will. Since reason is required for deriving actions from laws, the will is nothing other than practical reason. As many have observed, this presentation is inept because if the will is identical with practical reason, then it could only choose what it, namely reason, regards as good. I think the problem is relatively easy to see here, but not to solve. Kant needs pure practical reason to be both the source of the moral law, which is why its choices must be good, and also to be a faculty of reason, sorry, also to be a faculty of inference, which derives actions from principles. But the question is, how can it be both? In the grand work, Kant also talks about humans versus angels. After noting that the human will does not always follow the principles that reason recognizes as necessary, Kant introduces a new contrast, one between holy wills and the human will. Angels always act from the moral law. A human will does not invariably follow the moral law, but it ought to. Kant returns to the contrast between holy and human wills in both the practical critique and the metaphysics of morals. So he must think it is illuminating. However, notice that he cannot in this way produce a scientific system of rational or moral beings because there's no question of observers comparing differently acting angels and humans to discover a common genus of pure practical reason across them. His imagined com comparison is however useful in bringing out an important feature of his moral psychology, namely the efficacy of the moral law. Nothing needs to be added to a will determinable only by reason's moral law for it to produce morally good action, as it does in the case of the angels. I now want to turn to groundwork three and the, reason, and the proof of freedom there. After regressing from ordinary moral judgments to the principle underlying them, Kant raises a grim possibility at the end of groundwork two. Even if it is constitutive of morally good actions that the agent could will their maxims to be universal laws, 
Perhaps the whole edifice is just an illusion. Since unlike appearances, morally good actions cannot simply be assumed, he will need to show that the moral law is, quoting again, true and absolutely necessary as an a priori principle, and that requires a possible synthetic use of pure practical reason. Kant does not explain what a synthetic use of reason is, but the first critique's discussion of the real use of reason, I think, offers a clue. He distinguishes the real use of reason from the merely logical use that abstracts from all content. To make in nature intelligible to itself, reason seeks a highest genus and a lower species. So beyond content neutral principles that are introduced by logicians to capture the patterns of reasoning in lay people, philosophers need to formulate principles of homogeneity and specificity to capture the lay presuppositions in reasoning about nature. By analogy, a real or synthetic use of pure practical reason would be a synthesis, an inference that ordinary people make in thinking about what to do and that, reason, and that philosophers can capture in a contentful practical principle. All right, so groundwork three is a mess, as we all know. It offers a very complex interwoven chain of arguments. I'm just gonna consider the second subsection which is called freedom must be presupposed as a property of the will of all rational beings. In the first subsection, Kant had tried to show that a free will is identical to a will that is subject to the moral law. That would enable him to show that the moral law is an a priori principle for every rational will, if he can just show that freedom is a necessary principle of the practical I skipped a page, <laughs> which is now going to be a total disaster. All right, so I'm sorry. We need to shift, shift gears here, and we need to go back to the first critique, all right? So we had already done um, the, the um, we'd already done the resolution of the third antinomy, but I failed to, lead to um, introduce, sorry, wait a minute. It's the next page. Okay. All right, so I, we did the resolution of, um, all right, sorry. I, I apologize for this. All right, so we need to go back to the, the first critique. All right, so we talked about how understanding is conscious of its own act. Kant also thinks that reason as the faculty of inference is conscious of its own acts. So, like judging, inferring involves self-consciousness. Kant notes in his metaphysics lectures that animals have no understanding and no reason, for all acts of understanding and of reason are possible only insofar as one is conscious of oneself. Again here, the consciousness is not of one's state, but of one's acts. All right, this is the crucial point. The res in the resolution of the third antinomy, Kant presents his doctrine that humans cognize themselves as intelligible objects through the self-consciousness involved in acts of judging and reasoning. The beginning of the paralogisms chapter introduces a further claim. This is the crucial claim I need for the third section of the groundwork. All right. So in the beginning of the paralogisms chapter, Kant says this, self-consciousness is the only way for humans to understand what thinking is, and so what a thinking being is. The purpose of this passage is to forestall an objection to Kant's critique of rational psychology. Quoting here, it must, however, seem strange at the very outset that the condition under which I think at all is to be valid also for everything that thinks. The cause of this, however, lies in the fact that we must necessarily ascribe to things a priori, all the properties that make up the conditions under which alone we think them. Now through no outer experience, but solely through self-consciousness, can I have the least representation of a thinking being. Hence objects of that sort are nothing more than the transfer of this consciousness of mine to other things, which thereby alone are represented as thinking beings. 
This extraordinary passage, which I skipped when I was doing the first critique wrongly, uh, this extraordinary passage and the resolution of the third antinomy imply that besides ordinary moral consciousness and the principles of empirical psychology, Kant has a third guidepost for an account of practical reason, the self-consciousness that is involved in the activity of reasoning. So this was alluded to before, that we are self-conscious when we reason. Below, we will see that it is this third source, and we'll see how that is so crucial, and we'll see how it, it interacts with the standards for empirical psychology and the search for the necessary conditions for morality. All right, so let me just recapitulate and pick up where we were. All right, so what's so crucial that's coming out of the first critique is that Kant thinks of reasoning, of inference, as something that is done self-consciously and that you're aware of it as you're doing it. Now, he thinks of practical reason as the faculty of inference, right, as we saw. So, as we see, this will be crucial. Now, when we are turning to the argument in Groundwork 3, this turns out to be absolutely critical. The self-conscious character of reasoning and also the passage that I read for the, from the paralogisms, which I had skipped, the idea that the only access that we have to thinking is through self-consciousness. Sorry about that, just two pages we stuck together. Okay, so what's going on in Groundwork 3? In the first sec subsection, Kant had tried to show that a free will is identical to a will that is subject to the moral law. That would enable him to show that the moral law is an a priori principle of every rational will, if he can just show that freedom is a necessary property of a rational will. Here is the argument he gives. Again, this is, should be on your handout. Now, I assert that we must necessarily lend to every rational being that has a will, also the idea of freedom under which alone it acts. For in such a being, we conceive of a reason that is practical, i.e. has causality with regard to its objects. Now, one cannot possibly think of a reason that would self-consciously receive guidance from any other quarter with regard to its judgments, since the subject would then not attribute the determination of judgment to his reason, but to an impulse." End quote. Kant draws on his understanding of reasoning, which is why I had to go back to it. Kant draws on his understanding of reasoning as a self-conscious mental activity to support two related claims here. First, the human reasoner cognizes in the act of synthesizing, of making the judgment that her act is autonomous in the sense that it comes from her, not from an alien source. Second, because the only access that humans have to thinking is through self-consciousness, the reasoner cannot conceive of thinking in any other way which also explains why Kant uses this very odd term, lend, earlier in the passage. He can show that all rational beings must be understood as free because humans can understand things as rational beings at all only by transferring their own autonomous conscious thinking to them. So, right, so that's how this argument is supposed to work. That's why the self-consciousness is so crucial to it. Unfortunately, the attempted proof fails on at least two grounds. First, even if a subject cognizes that she makes judgments independently of sensible impulses, that would not inform her that she makes judgments capable of guiding action without sensible impulse. Second, even if humans can act on principles independently of sensible impulses, that would not show that their wills are determinable by a principle with the content of the moral law. So I think the argument fails. All right, so we're now gonna go on to the systematic account of practical reason in the critique of practical reason, starting with the faculty of desire.
Kant again, begins his account of practical reason by explicating the faculty that is to produce action to repeat, this is what we had before, the faculty of desire is the living being's faculty to be through the representation, the cause of the actuality of the objects. All right, so Kant's broad definition here includes animals, but of course for humans, we need to be dealing with higher faculties. And he explains how these work in the critique of the power of judgment, which he, he, he doesn't get to the higher faculties formally until the critique of judgment, but he's really presupposing this in the critique of practical reason. All right, so the critique of judgment explains that even though there are three basic faculties, in rational agents, the exercise of all of them is always grounded in the faculty of cognition. The mediation by the faculty of cognition is not through its intuitive, but through its conceptual side. More precisely, the exercise of the higher faculty of desire is grounded in, quote, the faculty of cognition in accordance with principles. That is, the faculty of desire in human beings leads to actions by means of conceptually represented principles. All right, so I'm just looking at the timing here. I, I, I'm sorry, I had to go back. I'm gonna run over, but let me just keep going, all right. All right, so now turn to determining the will. The first question of the critique of practical reason is whether pure reason is sufficient by itself alone to determine the will, or whether reason can be a determining ground of the will only as empirically conditioned, namely by pleasure. Since this is the central question of the practical critique, namely whether reason can determine the will, we need to take out the difficult question of figuring out what a determining ground is. So besides criticizing Cruzius' position that free actions have no determining grounds, the new elucidation also presents two doctrines that provide insights into Kant's understanding of grounds, determined and determining grounds. First, Kant distinguishes between two kinds of grounds, grounds of truth and grounds of actuality. For example, the subject concept, in the case of an analytic truth, the subject concept triangle is the ground of the truth that triangles are three-sided, whether or not any triangles exist. With an actual ground, the property or object would not occur if the ground did not occur. An actual determining ground is the cause of the property or object. So an initial gloss of the central issue would be, the moral law is a determining ground of the will if its representation stands in a causal relation to the human will. Second, the new elucidation rejects the notion of different levels of determination, quoting, just as nothing can be conceived which is more true than true, nothing can be conceived which is more determined than determined. So it's not a difference in the nature of the connection which constitutes the difference between physical actions and those possessed of freedom. All right, so he wants to say, look, you can't say that free actions are subject to doubt according to their futurition, that as if there ha it had some vague and determining ground that maybe worked, maybe didn't. He's saying that would totally undermine intelligent action. Where mental actions differ from physical ones is not in the degree of determination, but just in being caused to occur by rational faculties. So if intelligent action is possible, the chain from the conceptual representation to the will and to the action must be completely solid. <coughs> Excuse me. The introduction to the practical critique provides more detail about how the chain works. Quoting, in this practical use, reason deals with the determining grounds of the will, which is a faculty either to produce objects corresponding to one's representations, or at any rate, to determine itself to bring about these objects, to determine its causality. For there, in the latter case, reason can at least succeed in determining the will. Before it can produce action, before the will can produce action, it must represent an action to be done. Kant expresses this situation via an odd locution, the causality of the cause. He explains what the relation between the cause and its causality is in metaphysics lectures, quoting, Causality is the determination of a cause 
by which it becomes a cause or the determination of the relation of a thing as a cause to a determined effect. The cause is always to be distinguished from the causality. Although the will is a higher faculty to act, it can do nothing in the absence of a conceptually represented act to do. A more precise version of the central question is thus, whether reason can determine the will's causality, can produce in the will a conceptual representation of the action to be done. That I take it is the central question of the practical critique. And now we're gonna demonstrate this by going to the fact of reason. <laughs> Right. So just in case you all think the fact of reason is awful, I'm going to try to suggest it's not so awful. I think the standard view is actually among Kantians that the fact of reason is awful. So I'm going to try to say not so fast. Okay, so that's how we're going to prove this thing, that the moral law can determine the causality of the will. All right, chapter one of the first critique, of the, sorry, of the practical critique opens with an account of practical principles, i.e. propositions that cause the will's causality and that encompass lower levels, lower rules for action. Employing a familiar distinction, Kant analyzes practical principles as having both a matter and a form. The matter is the object and Kant rep and maintains that all such objects are the same in a crucial respect. They are sought only for the pleasure they promise. Pleasure associated with the object and experience makes the principle practical because that is what enables the representation of the object to determine the will. It's the expected pleasure that's determining it. Given the division of, into form and matter, the possibility of humans acting independently of considerations of pleasure and pain depends on whether the causality of their wills can be determined by the form of a principle by the possibility of a maxim having the form of practical law. All right, so Kant turns to the demonstration of the causality, um, sorry, Kant turns to the causality, let me just try that sentence again, Kant turns to the demonstration of causality after again identifying a free will with a moral law here in paragraph six. I do not ask, whether an unconditional law is merely the self-consciousness of a pure practical reason, and this pr practical reason is entirely the same as the positive concept of freedom. So he's identifying the moral law and the positive concept of freedom. Since the basic concept of freedom is negative, the absence of something, Kant now does the famous reversal and says, okay, we can't start with freedom as we did in the Groundwork 3. We have to start with the moral law. Hence human cognition of freedom, because you can't cognize something negative, hence human cognition of freedom and the moral law must begin with the latter. Quoting, it is the moral law of which we first become conscious directly as soon as we frame or draft or pose maxims of the will, which first offers its will for ourselves, which first offers itself to us, and which inasmuch as, it, as reason displays it, as a determining ground not to be outweighed by any sensible conditions, and indeed entirely independently of them, leads straight to the idea of freedom. Now Kant's claim that whenever a human attempts to figure out a maxim on which to act, she becomes conscious of the moral law can seem somewhat implausible, which is why no one likes the fact of reason. As he explains in the groundwork, however, he does not mean that the ordinary person is conscious of the abstract formula of the moral law, but that she's conscious of a con concrete instance. Kant repeats the claim that practical reasoners are conscious of the moral law in the notorious fact of reason doctrine of paragraph seven. But Marcus Vilicek to the rescue here, Vilicek argues that these two claims about being conscious of the moral law can seem totally unsupported only if scholars skip the later passage in paragraph six, where Kant invites his readers to consider two cases, two Gedanken experiments. In the second case, all possible empirical motives are placed on the side on one side of the decision. So this is the famous case, you all know this, but ask a man whether if his prince demanded on the threat of the same prompt penalty of death by immediate hanging, 
that he give false testimony against an honest man, he will perhaps not venture to assure us whether he would or would not overcome his love of life, but he must concede without hesitation that it would be possible for him. He judges, therefore, that he can do something because he is conscious that he ought to do it, and he cognizes freedom within himself. What is going on here? How should Kant expect common human reason to think about this Gedanken experiment? Given the setup of the, the, about the moral law offering itself to us whenever we think of a maxim, and the subsequent claim that humans are conscious of the moral law, Kant must be assuming that in considering whether to bear false witness, his readers are immediately conscious of the relevant instance of the moral law. I testify falsely only if I will false testimony. Then they think I cannot will false testimony and so infer I will not to testify falsely. If Kant's expectation is accurate, then each reader must, and this was, we alluded to this before, each reader must answer the first question of practical reason positively. Pure reason's moral law can enable the subject's reason to produce a conceptual representation in the will of an action to be done. It can cause the will's causality. So we talked a little bit about this before, but I want to go into this in a little more depth. Subjects who engage in the experiment would be conscious of the moral law in two ways. They are conscious of its content and they are conscious of it as a principle of inference because they are self-conscious in inferring from the instance of the moral law to the practical judgment, I will not to testify falsely. It is the self-conscious character of reasoning that enables subjects to have a practical cognition that their consciousness of the proposition is not inert, that their consciousness of the moral law is not inert, but leads them to represent a specific action to be done. Although ordinary people would not use this terminology, philosophers may describe the situation as a practical demonst demonstration that a principle with the content of the categorical imperative so act that the maxim of your will could hold at the same time as a principle of universal legislation is efficacious in practical deliberation. That is the conclusion that Kant draws in the title of paragraph seven, which I, which I list as my epigraph. The moral law is a basic law of pure practical reason, i.e. a basic inferential principle through which, sorry, a basic inferential principle through which practical reason actually operates. Pure reason is thus the source of the moral law through be being a faculty of inference and, moral and morality cannot be illusory because the moral law is a principle of human practical reason. All right, let me pause here a second and just see what time it is. Uh, I have gone over the time already and I have not finished. So what I'm gonna do is simply um, come to a conclusion by skipping lots of things later uh, because I think I can just sort of get to the central point here. Um, what I want to argue is that what is happening here is because of Kant's theory of how reasoning works, namely that reasoning is a conscious activity, and his theory that the only way that we can understand another as a thinking agent at all is by projecting our own reasoning onto them, that it's then going to follow that since each human being, when they think about practical deliberation, is aware of the moral law, then when they think about a practical agent, they are also going to think about someone who has the moral law within. And so let me just try to explain, this is a fairly radical claim that I'm trying to make here. And the claim is that the reason the moral law is central to Kant's account of human practical reason 
is that the only way humans can think about others as thinkers is through their own case. That's the only understanding we have of what a thinker is. And when humans think about their own case, they are conscious of the fact that the moral law is a basic principle by which they actually reason. Let me just say this, this has a very odd implication, and that is that there's a funny sense in which practical deliberation is, oh, sorry, that moral deliberation is not actually deliberating about the moral law. So Vadim was talking about all the efforts to apply the categorical imperative procedure. But as I understand Kant's position, what he thinks really requires reflection is how to formulate the maxim in light of all sorts of competing uh, obligations of duty that you might have, but the moral law itself can I will this to be a universal law, operates as a law of reason. It it's, operates just as, a, as any principle of inference word operates. So it's actually quite automatic. And so when you think about someone, so here's the claim, when you think about someone as a moral reasoner or as having any practical reason at all, as, as engaging in practical deliberation, since you have to project your own thinking onto them, then you have no way of doing it except by understanding them through your own mind, which you understand as having the moral law as one of its basic principles of inference. All right, so I'm going to stop there. I, I apologize for having gotten lost and having had a very complicated account, which then I had to leave out lots of, but I hope you've gotten the basic thrust of what it is about the theory of reason in the first critique that actually leads me to say that um, the moral law is central to Kant's theory of practical reason, but not because it's a necessary condition for morality, but because when we think about someone else as a practical reasoner, we have to think about them through our own mind, which is governed by the moral law. So we have to think about them as having a practical reason like our own, namely one with this principle. Anyway, let me stop there. <laughs>